Today's scripture reading is from John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18, the resurrection of Jesus, and Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. Early the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus, Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, but he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been laying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she, said, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbi, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Good morning, everyone, and happy Easter. The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Can you believe it's already Easter Sunday? Barbara Brown Taylor was an Episcopal priest, and I've mentioned her many times in the past. She left the church to go and teach in a college, and then she wrote a book about why she did. And she said the parts of the Christian story that had drawn her into the church were not the believing parts, but the beholding parts. And she quoted scripture. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. She said Christian faith seemed to depend on beholding things that were clearly beyond belief. She said, I wanted out of the belief business and back into the beholding business. I wanted to recover the kind of faith that has nothing to do with being sure what I believe and everything to do with trusting God to catch me, though I'm not sure of anything. She is... Um, a pretty, a pretty powerful speaker and writer, Bob Abernathy of PBS once did an interview with Barbara Brown Taylor and about this book. And he asked her if doubt had played a role in her leaving the church. And she said, here's the way I presently live with doubt. Doubt often brings me to poke at what I believe. And when it topples, I realize it was an idol. And so doubt has been a divine gift that has led me deeper into God. Now, nearly every preacher knows what happens next Sunday. We have a, a name for it. It's called Low Sunday. All of the pomp and circumstance is done, even though this year has been, you know, way less pomp and circumstance than usual. And just like the disciples who gathered in a locked room way back then, we have questions. Jesus is risen indeed. But what do we do now? Where did he go? Will we see him anymore? Where do we go from here? Who, who is with us? What do we do? But if you boil it all down to what would be like one main question, that would be, now what? John and Peter race to the empty tomb and the beloved disciple wins the race. You may remember me sharing some things about John's gospel. It's dripping with purpose. That charcoal fire, that pesky charcoal fire is there for a very important reason. It shows how Peter chooses to follow a man-made light rather than the light of the world. And this race has a purpose, at least one. Peter is going to have the authority of the church. He is going to be the rock that is built on. He will join Paul in setting up the church on his path toward the future. But at this moment, right after the cross, they have lost their center. Right here, they don't know what they belong to. When she was doing research on one of her books, Brene Brown interviewed 1,280 people. She said, one of the most powerful experiences I had was asking middle school children the difference between belonging and fitting in. They said fitting in is when you want to be part of something and belonging is when people want you just as you are. I get to be me if I belong and I have to be like you to fit in. She said, we live in a culture with a strong sense of scarcity. We wake up in the morning and we say, I didn't get enough sleep. And we hit the pillow saying, I didn't get enough done. We're never thin enough, extraordinary enough or good enough until we decide that we are. Now, Brene Brown is a Christian, and in January of 2018, she was asked to deliver the sermon at the Washington National Cathedral. And when she started up her sermon, she said she would describe her relationship with God as a love story. She said that if people looked at her, they would say she still has that spark, you know, after all these years of being in love. But if people asked her about her relationship with the church, she would say, it's a little more complicated. She joked a lot about it, but she said if her friends were, were to focus on that relationship with the church, she said they might advise her to either stay together or break up, just choose. The kids are suffering. 
and you know what I mean. If you don't already know, Dr. Brown has done a ton of research on the ideas of shame, fear, and belonging, and some other topics. And when it comes to church, her research has revealed really a terrible pattern. She said, our need for connecting to other people, something God has made very clear, it has suffered. She said, over the last 20 years, we have sorted ourselves by ideology into bunkers, into sections. We now live with, worship with, go to school with, hang out with people who believe like us. The more sorted we become, the lonelier we are. And she said, loneliness is an epidemic right now in our world. And she's right. And behind that barricade of beliefs is no real connection. She described a study done in the UK in 2018, and the study was on loneliness, and they discovered it was a huge problem at an all-time high. And it shouldn't be any surprise that a place that has a title for almost everything, um, like the Earl of Sandwich, the Viscount of Ayr, the Duke of Argyle, would appoint a minister for loneliness. But they saw it as a national health crisis, and it is. Loneliness is gr a greater predictor of early death than many of the terrible habits we've come to know about, including smoking, obesity, and excessive drinking. And she said she would describe what we have in our world right now as a crisis of spiritual connection. I'm quoting her. And here's the thing about the inextricable connection between me and you and the Syrian refugee and the mother in the Congo. It cannot be severed but it can be forgotten. And we have forgotten that we are inextricably connected to each other. God has us connected. She said, we have to find ways to be connected to the people around us, the people we don't know. As a scientist, she knows the research. It is built into our neurological systems. We are neurobiologically wired to take care of each other. It goes against our wiring to ignore others. And this is very biblical. So back to the disciples. After the tomb is found empty, they have, a, they have to figure out what to do. Peter has many roles in this gospel. Most of them are negative. He confesses that Jesus has the words of eternal life. He doesn't fully understand why Jesus washed his feet. He asks a lot of questions. He chops off an ear with his sword. He's really too spontaneous. He denies Jesus, of course. He is the first to hear about the empty tomb and the first to enter it. Basically, he's a bumbling disciple. Sometimes he gets things right, but mostly he doesn't. He's a lot like us. But the other disciple looked in and saw and believed. The beloved disciple. He represents the love and intimacy with Jesus. That is the goal of all disciples. All people who are loved by him, by Jesus. John represents this second disciple as the first to get to the tomb, the first to believe, even if his faith wasn't fully formed or incomplete. In verse 10, there's a word in Greek, autus. It's used there to describe home, translated as home. The disciples return home. But the Greek doesn't say home. It literally reads, they went back to themselves. We might say that they just went back to the way things were. Maybe they were going home to ponder how things would be different now. Probably both. And I believe that is what we are meant to do with Easter. You and me. We are not meant to just go back home and allow things to be like they've always been. That is not Christianity. Peter may have pondered what all this meant, but my suspicion is that he didn't really become a true understander until he had his own encounter with Jesus after he rose from the dead. All of those people who had a part in the event of that day believed that death had won. Each in their own way felt abandoned, unworthy, and maybe even unlovable. Mary did not understand until Jesus called her name. Then she realized in an instant of pure joy, she realized that Jesus was greater than death itself and that he was still alive, still here. Mary and all the rest 
were lost trying to make sense of a senseless cruelty in the world. And many of us do not know about this senseless cruelty. Some of us do. Some of us probably by will or by accident even contribute to it. But when we realize in the deepest part of our soul that there is no evil, no power, no struggle or injustice that can overcome what happened in that tomb, when we know this, we can answer the question, what now? What now? The world needs this everywhere. Everywhere, and I mean literally everywhere around us, there are people who are afraid. They want to belong. They want to know there's somewhere to turn when things go wrong in life. They want to know that they have not been tossed aside and left alone. All of those who have seen this hope need to remember our connection to all people and give them a place to belong. That is the next step. That is the answer to the question, what now? Christ's followers have this in common, period. A Christ follower overcomes the divide, crawls out from behind the bunker, and welcomes the lost, afraid, and hopeless. Those who do this are Easter people. They have seen the Lord, pushed down their own fear, and taken on the risk of loving their neighbors. Easter people have braced the darkness, seen the hope, and they know exactly what to do now. I pray we can be that church. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And the Easter people need to go forth and be light in this world. Amen. Amen.